there. Um, lots of people doing all kinds of hard work. People who came before me, um, you know, and did all kinds of great things to try to move these issues forward, kind of culminating with our de facto decriminalization that we have here now, where we've got a non-enforcement policy with the Vancouver police, as well as the city of Vancouver is is has a non-enforcement policy. Both of those are public policies that people can see online. Uh, they're called the Sex Work Enforcement Guidelines for the Vancouver Police and for the city is called the Sex Work Response Guidelines. And they state explicitly that adult consensual sex work is not a crime, is not a priority, it's not a bylaw violation in order to protect the, the safer indoor workspaces that we have, right? Hello and welcome to another episode of Canon Interview with, I'm your host, Freddie Shaben, and today we have a very, very special honorable guest with us. I'm so glad that we have her on this channel. She has a lot of information about decriminalization and legalization uh, in Canada. Uh, please let me welcome you, social justice advocate, Susan Davis. Hi, Susie. How are you? Great. How about you, Freddie? Oh man, I'm so happy that we could get you here. I've been looking forward to interviewing someone, anyone that has a lot of knowledge firsthand on the whole process and what you've been able to do. It's just amazing. I, I'll be honest with you, I looked you up, of course, online, and I can't believe how many articles you've been in. I can't believe how many people had interviewed you on the subject. So we have definitely have a professional here. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity for sure. Thank you. So go ahead and start us off with, you know, a little bit of background, whatever you want to start with, and then we can go ahead and transition to the process of what you've been doing and how you've been helping the, uh, the adult uh, sex worker industry and uh, uh, society and, uh, you know, how, how it's been going on in Canada, different parts. I know you've been all over the place. So go ahead, please. Sure. Well, um, I started sex work as an adult and worked in massage and escorting. Um, I'm from Halifax, so um, many people might not know. It's close to Boston and New York. It's on the east coast of Canada. And the, the industries all crashed there. So there was no fisheries, no coal mining. They killed all the trees with uh, by planting all the same tree. And so there was no jobs left. And so as a sex worker, there was no jobs for us either. So I joined a migration of people from the East Coast of our country to the West Coast, which is sort of where I landed. Um, I've been here ever since. I, I trekked out the other cities. It just wasn't the same sort of feeling as being on the ocean, as I'm sure you know. Absolutely. Uh, being on the coast is the best, right? So I also went from the East Coast, Boston to, to California, so I hear you. <laughs> Total same same direction for us, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so when I first came to the city, um, it was sort of the bad old times, if you will. You know, there was it was difficult to get a, an escort license. Um, every worker had to be licensed. And if you had prostitution charges, you weren't able to get a license. So I wasn't able to get a license. I had been charged working on the street. And so they kind of condemn you to the street, but we, a bunch of us discovered that we could run little ads in the paper without a license. And so we all rented up a, uh, townhouses and started working out of there kind of collectively, right? And from there, I moved off on my own and worked with different people through the years and for agencies and an adult film and, you know, all over the map as most of us do, right? We kind of migrate between genres and all throughout the industry. So uh, when I had been working on the street, I did experience some of the violence that street level sex workers endure. Um, at one point, diving out of a car after being assaulted. Uh, later, I, I had tried to report it like three times at, in that moment, which was like 1990. It's a long time ago. I'm an old broad. Um, <laughs> you look but, great. Uh, oh, not too bad, right? Not too bad for you an old lady. Great. You look great. <laughs> so I, I tried to report it and they wouldn't take my report. And 10 years later, after numerous women went missing here in the city of Vancouver, a man was arrested 
And when I saw his picture, I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, this is the this is the guy. And I have no proof of that or anything like that, but that's kind of what I live with, right? Um, and for people that don't know, there was an animal here who killed, we think, 49 women. He was charged with 27. Um, he's in prison forever, but you know, it was it was very trying and challenging. And he was the um, same, he was the same guy that he assaulted you, and you got out of there. Luckily, it was years later. Right. The same guy. You remember? Yes. Him. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought to myself anyway when I saw his picture, and having tried to report it and not having my report taken by the police, I felt sort of enraged. You know that if they had have taken any sort of interest in that case or tried to take my report or cared at all uh, about sex workers on the street, maybe he wouldn't have had the opportunity to kill all of those people. And I wasn't the only one, you know, um, they, they did it to everyone. There's a report in Vancouver, which is called wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire. Oh, wow. And that is a direct, that's a direct quote from the Vancouver police chief wow. in the time when all of this was happening. So, Lots of nimbyism and get rid of prostitution, which ultimately, of course, that's exactly what happened. They got rid of them, all right, you know, and they and they died. So there's also the highway of tears here. So it, it wasn't just Vancouver. It really impacted the entire province. There are women missing all over the northern part of our province. The province is huge. You know, for geographically speaking, there's there's portions of the province where you can drive for seven hours with no cell phone service. Yeah. It's really, really isolated, right? So it's dangerous on so many levels. So once all of that sort of, you know, came to light, I decided it was time for me to try to get into the action. And so I volunteered at a local sex workers organization called um, Pay Society and joined their board of directors and... From there, as you saw with all of those media articles, became the spokesperson for the society. Um, we did some media training before the trial of this animal began uh, because there was a previous serial killer. There have been three uh, in Vancouver. Um, so a previous serial killer's trial led to reporters approaching sex workers on the street and trying to get them to tell their stories, you know, like, were you raped? Did your friend die? Are you on drugs? Do you have AIDS? Thanks for the story, which is very harmful for people wow. who are really living in crisis, right? You know, no money, no compensation. Yeah, just totally ridiculous media approaches to these issues as we still see to this day, right? So we decided instead to give them a sex worker. So that was me. Uh, I was prepared and I rehearsed the all of the answers to the questions and I had support systems in place so that I, I wouldn't be too affected the way that others might have been. So during all of that time, it gave a real opportunity actually to shine a light on the issues that were facing our community and to show the ways in which society had really allowed this to happen, created the environment where this was able to happen. And um, it, it also created an opportunity politically so with so much attention being paid to the to the trial and the horrible ways in which my cohorts died um, and the failures of the system that's supposed to protect us, there was an opportunity. Uh, and so that's what I always like to say is that it's it's the legacy of the people who lost their lives as a result of all of these bad policies that we were had this opportunity to try to move things forward. So, you know, living in the downtown east side hotels, I was a drug addict. I had four heart attacks smoking crack cocaine. I've been in prison. You know, there's no Cinderella story over here, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had managed to clean myself up and get off of drugs and start working indoors uh, rather than on the street. So I had stabilized my own safety to a degree. But it just, it felt like there was this opportunity because of all of the the, the discussion about it in, in the public eyes, that for us to try to move some of these issues forward and try to address some of the things that had caused this problem. 
it gave me an opportunity to talk to politicians. I mean, I met everyone from the Governor General of Canada, who's the Queen's representative, to the mayor. I mean, I think I'm on my fifth mayor now, fourth police chief. And over time, the, I've developed relationships with these people, uh, all as a result of this, of this tragedy. So I think that that is one of the reasons why things have been able to move here forward here is because there's nobody in the city who doesn't feel somewhat ashamed or responsible for what happened because the people who wanted them off of their front lawn or out of their street or out of their neighborhood to the social services people who denied people support to the doctors who shamed people, there wasn't one aspect of society who hadn't contributed to it. And so I think that's why there was a, a willingness not to keep reverting to the same old end sex work abolitionist, all sex work is exploitation policies, right? So being, I grew up in a family of scientists. It's kind of like a perfect storm, right? I mean, I had a great upbringing. My parents were amazing. I studied music, uh, finished the Royal Conservatory of Toronto. I used to do rock samples for my grandfather at the university in the summers, synchronized swimming, lifeguarding, girl guides, you know, the whole bit. Um, and because I had that kind of upbringing and it was a scientific background, I think that my communication skills were such that I was able to almost translate, if you will, the things that I had seen, the experiences of my community members into a way that politicians and other scientific sort of academic type of people could understand. Um, through time, I've also learned how to speak to the police which it might sound strange, but they're a marginalized population. They're isolated and they stick to their own and they have their own language and they don't you know, interact with city staff. In fact, there's a real rift between city staff and police. Oftentimes it's based around language. Uh, so that's it's sort of how I've, I've, I've managed to do a lot of the things that I've been able to do. And also, of course, for all the other people that contribute to these things throughout the city, there are numerous sex worker organizations here, um, lots of people doing all kinds of hard work, people who came before me, um, you know, and did all kinds of great things to try to move these issues forward, kind of culminating with our de facto decriminalization that we have here now, where we've got a non-enforcement policy with the Vancouver police, as well as the city of Vancouver is, is, has a non-enforcement policy. Both of those are public policies that people can see online. Uh, they're called the Sex Work Enforcement Guidelines for the Vancouver Police and for the city is called the Sex Work Response Guidelines. And they state explicitly that adult consensual sex work is not a crime, is not a priority, it's not a bylaw violation in order to protect the, the safer indoor workspaces that we have, right? that police policy has now been adopted across the entire province with all 45 police services and the E division of the federal police as well adopting uh, the same non-enforcement lowest level of enforcement policy. So even though we've got the terrible criminalized the customer laws here in Canada, um, they're not being applied in our province and since that, you know, there hasn't been a sex worker arrested in Vancouver in more than 15 years. And there hasn't been a murder of a sex worker here in 12 years, that's, that's awesome. which says something. That's, oh, yeah. Yeah. For a city, right, with where we've had three serial killers, you know, that is quite incredible. Some people think that that's not a very high bar. And I, I just often think to myself, it's because they don't remember what it was like and they may be too young to understand what, how bad it really was. And I know that in places in the US especially, I mean, I just, I can't even imagine living in a state where they put sex offender on your license if you're busted for prostitution. I just, I, I think about my American comrades all the time and I just, you know, I hope that we can share some of the insight for the things we did here, you know. It came from a tragedy but I think that some of the things that we did could be duplicated regardless of that, you know, um, just from the ground level up, right? 
there are small organizations like community policing centers. Do you guys have community policing centers there, Freddie? Uh, I've never heard of, I know we have some sort of community uh, groups, whatever, coalitions that they work with the police for neighborhood, like Neighborhood Watch, and they do all these other stuff, but I don't think they really prioritize uh, sex work at all, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. And that's why I, this, I'm really, really curious about, like, uh, if I can ask you a question, how long sure. did it take you, Susie, to go from, you know, having this being a criminal, a criminal on the books as a criminal, as a crime, to where it's at now? How long, how much work and how long did it take you? I know it's a lot of work, but what was the period of time that it took? I would say that it's 19 years. Wow. <laughs> wow. But I think that it doesn't have to be as long as that. Now that we know some things, there are ways to sort of move things forward with, with that knowledge that we share, that we can share with people um, and take it forward in a, in a quicker kind of a way. Like one of the key things that I found was that the abolitionists, the ones who are terrified of sex workers and want to end all sex work and make huge sums of money from that, of course, um, that's another discussion. They are loud and zealot and, you know, they scream and yell at the police and they're always just so many tragic and horrible stories, you know, they just shock and awe everybody where we go in and are calm and reasonable and we don't swear and we make it better to work with us than it is to work with them because we listen to reason and we talk and discuss we don't scream shout point fingers and and make people feel guilty and obligated to do something you know um if you can get your foot in the door um in canada your member of parliament or your congressman, if you will, is obligated to meet with you. If you are in their voting district, they have to meet with you. That's the law. So we mobilize and try to meet with our with, with our politicians, right? Locally, um, in the city here, there's not ridings anymore. There's not districts. Uh, it's just sort of, they. it's like overbridging, right? There are 15 council persons and they represent, all represent the whole city. So it makes it easier even still to get in front of city politicians. And that might be one of the biggest lessons is just that starting on a small and local scale, especially in California, I mean, you're nowhere near Washington. How do you get there to lobby people? You know, if you live on the doorstep of the Capitol, then you can be over there beating the drum, you know? Right. Um, same thing for me, I don't live in Ottawa, which is, you know, so I can't go to the federal buildings and try to to be heard, but I can be heard by federal politicians that are here, um, as well as the provincial politicians, and especially within the city. So I think that people can sort of adopt that approach if you can just find ways to put yourself next to them. You know, it was a strange advertisement in the paper one day saying, have breakfast with the mayor. And it was a fundraiser for the Maritime Museum. And I, my whole family are involved in museums back in the East Coast of Canada. And so I just called up and kind of blagged my way in there, got myself a seat at the table and suddenly there I was having breakfast with the mayor, right? Nice, nice. Uh, you know, it's just, if you could talk your way through the door and there's one thing we have as sex workers, as a community, we can do the talking. We got that gift of gab, you know? For sure, right. You know, and the, for, for example, with the Vancouver police, you have the right to go as a delegation to the police board meetings. So all you have to do is write a letter requesting, like an email, requesting to appear as a delegation and tell them what it's about. And I, I've gone to, as a delegation, more than 40 times. Wow. And you just go and describe to them what it is the issue of the day is. And I remember uh, one in particular where they had been raiding brothels and massage parlors in previous to the Olympics, right? 
oh, you know, there's always this human trafficking for, for big sporting events. What a load of shit. That never plays out. That is not true. It's been proven over and over again that the money, the sex work, is before when they're building to accommodate the games. The three weeks of the games were nothing. There was so much security, nobody made any money. It was terrible. But in the lead up, in the, in the years just before that, when they were building Olympic Village and there was thousands of, of laborers here from all over the planet, oh, we were banking cash, you know. So I would be going in and talking to them about these things. And they had, they had this tactic that we call the peekaboo technique where they go and they kick the door open to catch you getting fucked by an old guy. You know what I mean? To humiliate you naked, you know, having sex in a prone uh, position, right? And no the police warrant. really... No search warrant? Oh, they would be serving a warrant is what they call it, but they're going in there basically to charge somebody with, with prostitution. So they would handcuff everybody, wouldn't let them get dressed. They parade people out in their work clothes, so lingerie and, you know, scantily clad, getting loaded into to vans, you know, in front of all the neighbors. Just horrible, right? Why, why are you yeah. doing that? You, yeah. yeah, big tough guys, right? Trying to save us, protect us. That's, that's how you protect me, right? Mm -hmm. So I would go in and describe to the police board what I've just described to you and just try to ask them, you know, imagine you're sitting on the toilet and somebody kicks the door in and won't let you pull your pants up and drags you out in front of everybody in your workplace and in your neighborhood and your neighbors. How would you feel? Right? And so they started to get the picture that this was inappropriate. Not only was it not working, and it was actually driving people onto the street, and it also had this impact of changing licensed storefront massage parlors into broken biscuits. So what it became was the parlor owners, it wasn't worthwhile spending $180,000, $200,000 to fix up a place, put the showers in, make the rooms nice, build a business. If the cops are just gonna come vandalize your business, shut you down, seize your license, arrest you. Um, so instead they would rent 10 or 11 condominiums. And so if one condominium had heat on it, and the cops found out about it, it wouldn't matter. They just abandon it and they still have 10. So rather than being centralized in one place, they had decentralized, which created a huge problem in terms of safety. Because if you're trying to run a business like that and you're trying to monitor 10 different apartments, it, it can be difficult, challenging, <laughs> right? Um, I, especially I had, for- I had 12 of them. <laughs> yeah. That's how I- Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the result of criminalization. It's much better for everyone if we can all be in one place. Because sure. you, then you have workers being able to support one another. You've got older workers t teaching the younger workers what the secrets of the work are. Um, so many reasons why oh, brothels yeah. are better, right? Imagine I had to be in between every transaction, six to eight clients for every girl. And I had 12, 12 girls, one in each place. And just being in, you know, the way I did it, I was in, in the middle of the transaction. So 100 transactions average a day. Can you imagine if I had it all in one place? I mean, it's like yeah. instead of 17 hours a day, I could, I could get away with. And this is only for eight hours a day operation. That's it. I, because I was all, yeah. all alone. You know, I had to do it alone because it's illegal. And I was trying to minimize, you know, people telling on me, people knowing exactly what I'm doing. Because I've had problems in the past with people telling. So, yeah, it, it definitely is. It's, it's it's night and day, like, you know, with what you guys are doing right now, it's just amazing. I was daydreaming today. I'm like, man, I wish I wish it was like that when I was in, you know, before I got re I retired. Well, I was forced into retirement, right? So, um, let Which me... Which isn't fair either. Like, honestly, if only people would understand that we need these places to work. You know, the main complaints from the community are condom mess public sex acts. They don't want to look out their window and see a girl giving a blowjob in a back alley. They don't want to look at the condoms and mess everywhere. Well, you know what would solve that? Letting us work inside, you know, and in the end, that was part of the driving force for them stopping raiding massage parlors here because they realized that they were causing 
the main safety concerns of the of the community. The other one, of course, is the clients cruising, looking for sex workers, making a mistake, thinking a woman who's a not sex worker is a sex worker, approaching her, scaring the crap out of her. That is also addressed by having a brothel so that the clients aren't confused. They know where to go and buy sex. They're not asking some straight lady in the street, you know? It, it just it boggles the mind, especially with conservatives who seem to be leading this charge. I don't know why. It costs them so much money to, to go on like this. It's like, don't they even see the fiscally responsible part of this? It just makes no sense to be, you know, spending all this money on enforcement, not collecting tax money from us. Like, what, what's the point? What are they thinking about? You know, I, I don't know. Not to forget the hypocrisy of it all, because I know from I had over 8,600 clients in Orange County, and I could I could tell you at least 2,000 of them were in a position, whether they were attorneys, DAs, judges, people that worked for the state. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And they're all in a position to to do something, but they go the opposite way when it comes to to, you know, public perception, which leads me to the next question for you is, so now the way it is, it's the cops are leaving you alone, right? As far as they're not enforcing the laws, it's all no. practically the laws are still on the books, but nobody's enforcing them. So it's not really That's how right. criminalized on the books, right? Right. Has, has the perception changed at all before and after this happened, the, the, the transition about sex workers? Absolutely. Um, People don't say prostitute here. They say sex worker, whether it's the news, somebody outside of it, in a school, you know, so there's that fundamental shift right there. Um, as well as I take part in all the local politics. I'm a member of my local community policing center, which they're a not-for-profit. I know I mentioned them before. And so what they are is uh, they're linked to the police and they get funding from the city and the, through the Vancouver police but they're democratically controlled. So the membership vote for the board of directors and for the priorities for that will be set by the community policing center for safety in the community, right? So I live in a really Chinese neighborhood. There's Taiwanese people, Vietnamese people, um, Burmese people, Japanese people. I'm learning to swear in Chinese, it's awesome. <laughs> they're party animals, it's so cool. Um, but Asian hate crimes are a huge problem here. Uh, people writing things on their buildings, um, violence in general. And so that priority ha is, has come to the community policing center. They're gonna create an app uh, to help people report more easily when something is happening, right, to them. So I take part in that and I brought my organization with me. So my little group that I manage, that I'm the director of, we, we're not officially incorporated or anything like that, which makes it hard for us to access um, government funding. We always have to have an administrator. So the Community Policing Center said they would do our administrating. And so I was able to receive 40000 in funding and they just, I just run my money through their bank, right? And then it goes on their books and through their taxes I provide the receipts to them, all that kind of thing. Um, as well as I've been able to talk to them about the policies in their uh, constitution, which talked about getting rid of drugs and prostitution in the community, not realizing that there are 12 massage parlors on this street, right around my little butcher shop where I live and work upstairs, right? So I told them, you know, why, why are you doing that? So uh, fundamentally on this really low local level, I have removed that push to remove prostitution. And instead the massage parlor owners and workers and everybody take part in the multicultural festival. They come out and come to the annual general meeting at the Business Improvement Association, you know, and take part in local politics and are seen as part of the community. Um, we're working on some final bias things that exist within the licensing process here, which you can get, what you get is a health enhancement center license, and then you're supposed to get a development permit as well. So a development permit you associate with building stuff, right? 
And sure, I can see a new business building, whatever. Sure, you've got to have that permit all filled out and your inspections done. Okay, I that that's reasonable. But for every, you have to have that indefinitely. You have to pay for it every single year. Why? They said, oh, it's a tool against bad operators. I was like, what bad operators? There's no much, bad how operators. Much is, how much is it, Susie? I think it's like 600 bucks. A year? Right? The, the license is 270 and I think that the development permit is like six hundred dollars a year. This is which you... it's a money grab. It makes me mad, right? And it's totally biased. You know, there's no I, bad I, business owners. I would, have glad, I would have gladly paid them that because you know we know we make good money. So as long as any, I would have paid anything to shut them up. And you want money? Here's money. Just leave me alone. You know. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying, though. I get it. And we're just trying to remove those biased um, policies and practices. Uh, you know, from the way that they do business. And that's another little localized thing that's going to happen, right? Um, the same thing with the way the inspectors handle things. Uh, there was a movement that they wanted all of the businesses on the ground level, street level, to remove window co coverings. They said it was for continuity, for the look of communities. So it was totally aesthetic, right? Um, but they didn't, they didn't make the gay bathhouse remove theirs with good reason because gay men face stigma and all kinds of harm if they're outed. The same thing applies to sex workers. So we had inspectors screaming, yelling, threatening uh, business owners, remove it or we're gonna find you $2,000 a day. Finally got them to stop doing that and made them take sensitivity training about it. You know, funny little things like that which are overall, over time, changing the whole dynamic of the way that sex work is viewed in the city. And so instead of uh, a business inspector having a bad day and thinking he can just go around and bully the local massage parlor to make himself feel big because he's being a jerk, he gets in trouble for it and realizes, no, this is the same as all the other businesses. I'm not allowed to do that to anybody. And the same thing applies to police, the way that they used to vandalize um, businesses and things like they'd go in and cut the phone cords and smash the toilets. And what are you doing? You know, if you're going to arrest somebody at the fanciest hotel in the city, right? The Pan Pacific, you're not smashing the hotel as you're arresting somebody. Like, what are you doing? You just, you think you can get away with it, but they don't do that anymore and they can't and they don't get away with it. So, so me, yeah, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure, uh, sure. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but before I forget, if I, if I just say I want to I open a brothel tomorrow in Vancouver, am I able to do that legally or do I have to do it a certain way where it's like not nobody asks questions, don't, don't ask, don't tell type of thing? Or how does that work? So what you would do is secure a location and then go and apply for the license. You need to have, um, it has to be in the right zoning area, just like any industry, yeah, right? Commercial um, zoning. Like you, right, um, and, and all that sort of thing. And it's just a permit process then. They do a criminal record check, um, which they don't do for all businesses and which is that proportion of it is under scrutiny. The main focus being, uh, have you done something to children? Are you a danger to the people who might work for you? At this point, that's what the purpose of that is. So, and then you just go about hiring people. They may want to, um, if you're building a place from scratch, like it's easier to buy a, a brothel from someone else because it's already passed all the inspections and things. Uh, but in the case of um, a place that's brand new where you've had to put in showers and you've put all this thing and then like any other business, you would have to have an inspection from building inspections and stuff like that. But and it's not, yeah, it's pretty much. They can't just, uh, they don't have to give you the license, right? They could just say X, Y, Z, we're not gonna give you a license, correct? It's like, the licenses that, that I had in Vegas, I had a, a, something called an outcall promoter license. It was per director approval of the business office in, I was in Clark County, which is where the strip, Las Vegas strip is. Is it similar to that? Like they have, they have the right to say no? To give you the license um they do but it would be very rare um 
especially if you meet all of the criteria. In particular, since the focus here is on trying to create more businesses and more indoor workspaces to stem the tide of workers being forced onto the street, now right? How, so, how does a tax work? Does it tax? Does a tax work in that kind of business, like a brothel, just like it would if I owned a restaurant or a bar or whatever? Is it the same taxation? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, what about and the, the two things are not linked, right? So um, in Canada, the corporate tax rate is 26%. I would recommend a corporation just course. because it's simpler that way. You know, um, there's provincial sales tax and federal sales tax called PST and GST, which you would charge, you know, build into your price because it's a service. It's goods and services taxes, right? Um, anything over any sales over thirty thousand dollars, you have to pay that extra um, taxes. But since you pay GST on your rent, that becomes tax deductible, so you get that money back, and it sort of balances things out. But yeah, what about for the workers? Are they are they uh, independent contractors? The employees, or you have a right to do it however you want to, like any other business? And do they pay taxes? Well, it depends on the individual worker. We try to encourage people to pay taxes because then you can you can build some credit and maybe buy a house or a car or, or move your life forward. You know what I mean? As anybody should be building credit, right? Um, and having a declared income is part of that. But uh, uh, sorry, what was the fir first part of the question? Oh, how do you do it? So lots of people will do it by um, rent the room, right? So uh, they'll charge the worker, the client, whomever, $28 or $50 an hour to use the room. And then what the woman makes in the room, or sorry, I shouldn't say woman all the time, what the worker makes in the room is theirs. Um, other people will take a percentage or some places will offer all inclusive, but I think that whatever business model suits you and what you're comfortable with is mostly, is, is acceptable, right? So. People are allowed to overtly advertise, you know, in the places where sex work ads are, like Leo's List and places like that. Um, so it, it can say directly, you know, I offer bareback low jobs, I offer domination, I offer, I offer, I offer. Um, and they'll have an extras menu and things like that. Some of the uh, bigger places like Carmen Fox, um, who operate in a neighboring city, but under a very similar um, enforcement model because Burnaby is, a, is just a city over from us. We're like like the, the 100 kilometers of city like you guys have. We're in a valley, and so it's a string of cities that goes along Vancouver, Burnaby, New West, Coquitlam, just all the way down the valley. Um, so Burnaby is actually very similar to the way things are here. So that's where they're operating. And she rents the room. Basically, it's $130 the last time I checked or something. And... Uh, and then she says, use your imagination because you're not getting everything under the sun for $130, right? And so it goes up from there and it's, you know, 200, 400, 600, like that, you know? Yeah. You so yeah. everybody kind of does their own model, but, and variations therein. So, but mostly as independent contractors. So workers are um, expected to pay their own taxes find their own benefits, extended medical and things like that, which are also pretty simple to get here, right? They don't ask you your occupation when you're buying uh, medical insurance and stuff like that. It's, you know, because we have um, essentially free medical here, um, free prescriptions now too. And then uh, you can get extended medical for glasses and teeth and stuff like that, which isn't out outrageously expensive, so. Uh, okay, what about like banks and loans? Like I was talking to a couple of people from uh, Australia and even though it's legalized in some provinces or states and some uh, it's criminalized completely. And one of them was telling me, one of the escorts or the sex worker was telling me that it was still hard for her to, to deal with banks. They still don't want, because of that stigma, they still don't want to deal with them like they would like an engineer or lawyer or whatever, you know, whatever profession. How is that in, in Canada where you're at? Um, it's the same. Uh, I, you know, I sort of manipulate it to get the credit that I have. 
you know, you put down consultant or entertainer or something like that. Um, and since a lot of the banking, uh, like for example, with payment processing, which has become a real problem for everybody, especially with platforms like OnlyFans or even just trying to accept credit cards to sell adult film to your clients or those kind of things, or, or just for, for calls, you know, um, because of the, all of those payment processes are mostly based in the United States, we're all living with that kind of restriction and law. And so every time you hear that Visa and MasterCard are targeting, you know, sex work or exploitation or whatever, that is impacting us as well. And I have certainly heard of people's money being seized, um, you know, after working for a couple of months, put bank in some money and then having it just yanked. Uh, so it still remains a huge challenge because for the most part, I think that the financial services sector is based in the U.S. And then if you can get payment processing like from overseas in, in the Netherlands or something, they want 25% of each transaction. Like what the hell does that even mean? You know, in my little butcher shop, because as I told you before, I own a small meat shop and then I live upstairs and I have my, my escort space up there in my apartment above my shop. Um, but in my meat shop, I pay $180 a month for up to $30,000 in transactions with no percentage at all. So it makes it very difficult to negotiate better rates, um, better service from credit card companies because of all of this rhetoric being promoted. In particular in the US, you've got a real plague of anti-sex work people collecting money, making money off of the rescue industry, as it were, right? And it's really impacting everybody globally in that respect. So That's credit right. unions are better than standard banks, right? Like a credit union, build a relationship with them. They did give our sex workers cooperative a bank account. It said West Coast Cooperative of Sex Industry Professionals. So we have a bank account. Um, but we never tried to get payment processing or loans or anything like that. So, you know, it's it's definitely the same as what it's like in Australia. I remember like all the advertising companies I was using for years, you know, since 90, 80, excuse me, since 98, when I got online with this business. Uh, at first it was, um, I remember using iBill and CC Bill back in the day. Then it went to... Um, uh, uh, let me see, J, uh, what is it? Um, the one that Elon Musk uh, started, uh, I forgot the name of it. Anyways, and every time we, we started using something, then they the government stepped in and told them they can't have any type of adult work. Uh, PayPal, excuse me. PayPal, when I was using them, and they were like 8%, they were expensive. They, at one, one point after the government stepped in, they lost 33,000 accounts. And I had few of them with them because I had live video chat and all this stuff back then also. And then uh, when I was using even uh, not, to, not too long ago, before I got in trouble, uh, when, 2012 to 2017, I was using, uh, of course, I always used Eros and City Vibe and then Backpage. And look what happened to all of them. C City Vibe, you know, they had to go through hoops every time I had to pay for the, for it, everything had to be done, you know, just like you and I are talking, there's no more credit card thing because they, they couldn't get any merchant account. Backpage went down and we, and to, before they went down and got shut down, we were using uh, Bitcoin, we went to Bitcoin. That's the only way we could get our ads up. And it was a pain in the butt and it was very expensive, you know? And then of course, Eros, yeah. Eros they were gonna get indicted and they moved all their operation overseas to Netherlands. And I don't know what they're using, but, uh, it's really going up the wrong way. They're, they're barking up the wrong tree now in the U.S. They're targeting uh, the clients like they're going to stop, you know, the nature of, of men, you know, that want to, you know, take care of them, their nature and the women that want to make money off of it. I know. And it's 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 a tragedy because they they want to stop violence. And I think that deep down. These people really believe what they say. You know, they believe that that's what they're fighting. They're fighting violence in the sex industry. But with what they're doing, they're causing violence. They displaced us on Backpage when they removed Backpage. My clients couldn't find me. Now I have to meet new men 
who I don't know. And the truth of it is that a regular client is 90% less likely to assault and kill you than some stranger you've never met before. Of course, of course. And it was the same thing with the street, right? Like moving the sex work stroll from corner to corner to corner, sweeping the neighborhood. They just move on. We just move down to another neighborhood and start all over again. But then you don't know your clients and your clients don't can't find you. And it's not, not only for sex workers, but for clients too. In the John's Voice research, um, Chris Atchison is a researcher in at Simon Fraser University here, interviewed almost a thousand uh, sex buyers and 42% of them had experienced full out violence when trying to purchase sex. And nobody ever talks about that because they don't report, they're not calling the cops. The shame and the stigma against the clients is worse than the same shame and the stigma that the sex workers themselves experience. You have a lot and of it's all, yeah, exactly, right? Families, jobs, you know, your entire life and reputation could be destroyed. You know, look at what's happening to that Matt Gates. Not like he's my favorite person on the planet, but Jesus, you know, all for having had, you know, a young sex worker, she was 17. They keep talking about it as if she's a child Anyway, you know, you know what, you I know just... What, you know what, Susie? I totally agree with them going after the real gorilla pimps that grab girls, kidnap girls, manipulate girls at 13, 14, 15, whatever. Put them on the street, take all their money, beat them up, put them back on the street. If, don't let them sleep. All, all the coercion and all this stuff. I'm 100% behind this. That's a problem. Yeah. But there is not a yeah. lot of problem, right? It's not like... It's it's not like COVID, uh, you know, infestation. No. By all means, no. There is very sw very small percentage today that still you know operating with that old pimp pimpology, you know. Yeah. Uh, thinking right. Absolutely. I agree yeah. With that. But how are you going to stop it if you're going after the clients? If you're going after people like me that was running a very very a very good, solid, safe, discreet environment operation for both the escorts are making great money. They were happy. The clients felt safe. How, how are you going to stop that from stopping something like this? Now, what you've done is you've taken the all the possibilities for the people that just want to have their nature met, taken care of their you know their their needs, and the the women that have all the needs for financial you know support, and that's what they that's they can't you know they don't have the the education or they have you know bad divorces. Like I worked with so many moms, single moms with bad divorces. They did not have the the education or the time or you know nothing could give them enough money to support their kids the way they want to so they end up in this now now what is the government doing they're not thinking about anything else and you know here's the thing you said something a little bit a minute ago about they really believe that they're helping the violence and stuff you know what maybe some of them do maybe like the bible thumpers or whatever but i promise you from over 30 years in this business and over 20 of them was online i promise you a lot of them are clients. Of course. I and had, more than I that. I had a CHP, which is California Highway Patrol. He was a client. Yeah. Yeah. He got, he got in and trouble I'm, for child pornography. was trying to set me up before I got arrested so I can set him up because he was already a client. But I felt something because I have not heard from him in two years. I did a little homework. I'm like, oh, no, I know what he's doing. But yeah. believe it or not, I could tell you when I was going through my case, and I'll just tell you this real quick. I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on it, but I just, because we no, have- No, please. I love, I was fascinating, please. The DA, all the DA wanted was my list, the list of my clients, because everything was done in codes, different names, whatever, right? Except for a few people. And he was gonna give me a probation, one year probation. They took over 10 million worth of cash from me. I wanna give me my cash back. You know, just give me the list. I took a deal from the judge. He didn't want to give me a deal because he was trying to pressure me. And I said, you know what? I can't do that to these people. I got all these people. I got all doctors, lawyers, high, high end professionals, all VIP type. I got guys on TV, on move, whatever, right? In the public eye. And, you know, I said, look, there's guys in your office. I'm telling this to DA. He doesn't care because you got that mentality of they want that power. They want that notch in their belt. And you know what? He got it that year. He got DA of the year. But this is the kind of mentality and freaking ego that we're dealing with. It's a lot. And I'm sure you can. you can Absolutely. Right? The you, war you know, on vice, right? 
you had is that the police really take it personally. Yeah. And yeah. so do these DAs, right? They think it's their machismo. Their, you know, it, it's, it shows what kind of a man they are, if they can be saving all these people and doing all this stuff and, and imposing themselves. It's the bully in them, right? They love to be able to just crush people and crush your dreams and ruin your life, you know? It, it's, uh, and never mind that they make money off of it. There was a point here in Vancouver where the counter exploitation unit was down to three members because they had nothing to do. Because once they had to stop doing all these sweeps and stuff, well, they, they didn't need all those officers. So now we're talking about their mortgages, their children's futures, the food on their tables. Then they feel threatened. You have to which justify. Is why, you have to justify their yeah. needs. Yeah, and they don't get the budget if they don't make the arrests. And this is all part of that industrialization of the war on drugs, the war on prostitution. It's a big cash cow, right? Prison guards, uh, policemen, lawyers, judges, all these people's it's income. A big it's a big machine. And you know what? If there is, can you imagine if you drop the crime by 90%, like you guys, you know, you said the violence, I'm sure, is down, the rape is down, right? Yeah. In Vancouver. Can you imagine? This is job security. What are they going to do? There's going to be yeah. not a lot of people going to jail. Well, they'll, now you got the guards in jail. They're, they're losing their job, right? It's all, yeah. it's all, you know, what can you do for me or what's good for me? They don't really care about the truth, which is, oh, I want to. It's so funny because they, they referred to all the girls I was working with as victims in my indictment, right? But then again, they were trying to get them at the same time. They're trying to force them to say things and do things. It was just really dirty, right? So they, 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 do, it, they do it both ways. They want to <laughs> use them as a victim in indicting somebody like me because I'm the big bad wolf. But on the other side, they're they're bad because, you know, we're going to arrest you because you're a prostitute. Which one? You That's can't right. go both ways. You don't want to cake and eat it too. That's just politics. Yeah. And it's a conflict of interest. Half the time when we see lawmakers and policymakers talking about these issues, they're listening to the police as experts. When they have this overt conflict of interest where... They profit from our criminalization. Same thing applies to drugs, you know. They profit from it. So, of course, they're going to support more police action, more funding for police, better sweeping, you know, northern spotlight, stop the human trafficking. Oh, for Christ's sake, you know. <laughs> it's a big cash cow for them, you know, and it yeah. wins votes, right? But those you guys, you get them those solid jobs as cops and prison guards. Suddenly, they're in unions. They've got benefits. They're making more than 35 an hour to start. Suddenly, you've got yourself a big voting base, all of whom want to see you stay in power. You know, it's uh, it's pensions, vicious like that. Pension, yeah. benefits, insurance. I mean, all sorts yeah. of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, the Vancouver what? police, they have their own bank. Okay, so that $350 million a year budget that goes to the Vancouver police gets deposited into their private bank from which they make loans, from which they have their own pension, mortgages. It's, uh, the big money it's machine. unbelievable. The big yeah. money machine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to start a bank, mm -hmm. sex worker bank. You know what? Yeah, that insurance, medical insurance, regular insurance, whatever it is that they need, that would be our own union. It should, you know, that's yeah. how it should be, really. Yeah, collective, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just... That's how they started this thing with the marijuana, you know, back in, you're doing exactly what the guy in San Francisco did, and he went to jail so many times until finally he broke them. It's a marathon, that's for sure, right? I mean, 19 years you've been working on this. God bless you. I mean, you know, the good news is we have people like you that make, you know, make it happen, right? Uh, where you really care, obviously, you put yourself, I'm sure you're not making money off the when you, with the process no. of you going from point A to point Z with the decriminalization or them not enforcing the laws. So my hat goes off to you. I wish I could do what you did. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a challenge here. A lot of people have tried here. I've been reading a lot about it for about a year, about the legalization, decriminalization. And a lot of people have tried and failed and tried and failed. And, and uh, you get a lot of doors. You know, it's just uh, there's, there's forces that they, you know, they don't otherwise, if they want it to happen, but it'll happen, but it's just going to take, take time, you know? There's a pretty good movement going in San Francisco down there, though, right? 
yeah. uh, Maxine Dugan and the Erotic Service Providers Union and um, people like that. You know, I think the hardest part for advocacy is burnout. Um, you get so tired and it can be so crushing, you know, never to get anywhere. You know, you when on the days that you do have victories, you really savor it, you know, but it just takes so long and you're in the, while you're waiting, people's lives are being destroyed. And, you know, it just, it feels so, so, so ridiculous and counterintuitive to keep bashing your head against the wall, you know? Um, but for some of us, you know, especially in my case, because I survived that guy who killed so many, it's what they call survivor guilt. And one of the symptoms of that kind of post-traumatic stress disorder is doing anything you can to prevent it from ever happening again. And so you kind of go out on a limb and risk everything trying to, to change things, you know? I, I, when you talk about people being arrested on the marijuana front, I wish I could get arrested. Oh, Jesus. Just to bring a spotlight to it, to anything, you know, to try to... To, to make things go faster, you know? When you think about the Martin Luthers of this world um, and the Gandhi for that matter, you know, these people were all arrested trying to change things. So were the suffragettes, you know, the women's rights movement. People have been arrested, the civil rights movements for as long as there have been civil rights movements, you know? So, you know, if, if that's what it takes, that's what it should take. And I think about parallels to the to the LGBTQS2 movement as well, that they, it used to be illegal to be gay. You know, it was a crime. It's, I, I don't even know, is still sodomy still a crime in some of the states down there? I think so, Mississippi, Alabama, they were trying to change it, but it's still on the yeah. board. Some states. Yeah, just, you know, um, and I just, I think about how far things came and, and as a sexual, sexually oriented uh, crime, it, we have a lot of parallels there as well. And, and just how people coming out of the closet, uh, being more open about who they are, um, trying to create a safe environment for that, you know, especially when it comes to the clients. Uh, we did um, try to create an opportunity for clients to have a voice, um, which we were taken advantage of by a horrible propaganda company who ended up using all of the footage. She filmed me for two and a half years for a documentary, two and a half years of my life, and then cut everything that I said at the end and basically wasted my time the entire time just so that I would get her next to the clients whom she then edited to make them seem self-serving, you know? They didn't talk about how the men felt about the providers. They they talked only about why the men wanted it, you know? It's all in it, the it's editing. Just so yeah, right? It's just gross. And so I think that, you know, in some ways, if we can try to move things forward and help people to come out and feel safe about talking about it, um, that plays its role as well. Because, as you say, many, many sex workers are single parents. You could lose your kids if you come out, if you're discovered, you know, uh, you, your whole, your family could disown you. There's, it's, it's that much risk, just like it was for people in the gay rights movement. I, so I understand and I sympathize, but there was nothing more liberating than telling my mother and father and never having to worry about it again. You know, they didn't reject me again. I'm lucky, you know, again, it's like a perfect storm. In, in my case, that seems to have allowed all this stuff to happen and allow me to progress as far as I have, to be sitting now thinking about trying to develop a credit union and take control of payment processing, processing for sex workers, by sex workers kind of thing. When would we have ever thought of been able to do that 20 years ago, you know? But here we are now sort of contemplating it and, and having people give us feedback and you know, thinking about how we might come up with a million dollars to secure the bank and do all those things, right? Amazing. You know, it is. It's it's incredible how liberating it can be. So I hope more people will get to experience that. 
you know, more than anything is, is what I really want for them to feel safe, feel good about it, you know, see the benefit of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I have uh, one more thing. I always do this at the end of any, every interview, two reasons why I do this. My purpose of this channel is to give you a platform to say whatever you want. And two is to change the perception a little bit. So now I want to give you the pl to give you the floor. You can say anything you want to our audience, whatever comes to mind, you know, a few minutes or whatever. It's all yours. All right. Well, I guess, you know, for the people that are out there who are sex workers, who are being affected by criminalization and all of the negative things that we've been talking about here today, just to have hope um, and to remember that over time, these things can change. We've seen it in New Zealand. We're seeing it in Vancouver. Uh, we see it in parts of Australia. That seems to be what's playing out in Canada. Just hope that people can draw some inspiration from those kinds of things and to, to remember that whether on the days we feel down and like we're not getting anywhere with this movement, we will, we will get there. We may not see it in our lifetimes, but everything that we're doing is so important and to, to try to stick with it. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you definitely inspired me. Canada and, and uh, in particular, where you live, they're very, you know, Vancouver is very lucky to have you there. Uh, I wish we have a Susie over here <laughs> and I'll be right there with you. Uh, I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for all the work you've done. I know it's, you don't always get rewards or anything like this. Or you don't get plaques, you don't, you're doing it for, it's a, it's a labor of love. And uh, I, I, I'm really very inspired and I thank you so much for giving us this amazing time. I, will, I would, could talk to you for 10 hours. I would like to invite you again, not only sure. on my channel, I'm also starting another channel, which is about change sure. and, you know, getting your goals met and changing things whether it's what you're doing or changing about themselves, I'd like to invite you on that channel as well. And sure. uh, I thank you so much. You're awesome. I hope we can stay in touch and you're welcome. Anytime. We can do this again and again. And uh, I hope your husband is okay. I hear him coughing. Yeah. He hasn't been feeling good. And <laughs> um, I, I really, really appreciate your time. You're doing great work. You're doing God's work. God bless you. And I, I wish you nothing but success, health, and happiness. Thanks so much, Freddie. We'll talk to you soon, babe. For sure. Thank you so much. And uh, I, will, I will definitely see you soon for sure. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Thank so you. now you can end the recording, right? <laughs> yeah. And there you go, guys. It's another episode of Canada Interview With. I'm your host, Freddie Shabin. Stay healthy, stay safe, and be happy. <laughs>